Okay, three characteristics of existence. The Buddha, when he attained enlightenment, discovered that all beings possess the three characteristics of existence. Three characteristics called anicca. Don't read too much about the Pali terms for those who are very new, but just to take note, like just to familiarize yourself. Uh, what I'm trying to do here is also get you all familiarized with some of the terms, concepts, and then later when you do your reading, go for other courses, go for other talks, you will know already a bit about the basic concepts of Buddhism. So anicca means impermanence, dukkha means suffering, unsatisfactoriness, anatta means insubstantiality, non-self, no soul. Buddhism is quite famous for this uh, term, uh, no soul. Uh. Usually dukkha translated as suffering, but that's too strong a word. Personally, I think unsatisfactoriness is a much better word. Uh. Then anatta, non-self, no soul. Un insubstantiality is a better word, but I will explain all this in detail uh, as we go along. So, anicca, impermanence. This is one thing demonstrable in science. Everything changes. Everything is impermanent. Everything is in the process of changing into something else. Even for us, we are standing here, we are in the process of change. Even the stars, the galaxies, everything is in the process of change. Everything in this room is in the process of change. Even the Buddha statue, it may look the same. But as time goes by, you may not see that because it's in a short space of time. But over the course of years, 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 you will see, you will degrade, you will deteriorate, and so on and so forth. So even inanimate things are in the process of change. This one, inarguable. You can prove it by science. Okay, dukkha, unsatisfactoriness, suffering. Because everything is impermanent, existence is subject to dukkha. That is because we always crave for pleasant things. We don't want unpleasant things. But pleasant things never last. Unpleasant things also never last. So every time you want something pleasant thing, oh, you want it all the time, even for ourselves. We are quite happy when you are young. We are quite happy. We wish you would always be young, right? Who wants to grow old? That's part of the suffering. Right? When you grow old, you, you start to suffer, you cling on to your youth and all this, all that. But unavoidable, ma, because we are all subject to change. Everything is subject to change. Therefore, there is unsatisfactoriness. Our existence is subject to dukkha. Okay, this is the tough one. Anatta, insubstantiality, non-self, no soul. The other two, you can actually have a, an idea. La. Anatta is the one which is quite tough to explain. What it means is that there is no permanent or unchanging self. The self we are conditioned to exist, what we think is our, what we are, like for example me, Brother Lee, we are actually made up of nothing more than different mental and physical constituents which are always in a constant state of change because of cause and effect. So, the term anatta. Atta means self or permanent soul. So when you put an A, sometimes in the Pali, uh, this is a Pali term, you put an A and in front, it means no. La. Therefore, Atta means self or permanent soul. Anatta means non-self or non permanent soul. La. So Anatta means there is no permanent self, there is no permanent soul. Soul connotes a permanent self within us. La, that you know, I will explain later la, that uh, after we die, it goes on either to heaven or hell. It's a permanent self. So anatta means that there is no such permanent self. So in Buddhism, we are actually composed of basically two things called mind, nama, body, rupa. Later on you hear this term very often. Nama, rupa, nama, rupa. Nama, rupa means mind and body. And this can be uh, separated again into five aggregates which are constantly changing. So these five aggregates, let me explain. The first one is matter, rupa. This is our physical body. Again, it's composed of different, different things. The next one is our consciousness, called vijnana. Who is not conscious here? All conscious, right? Everybody is conscious. Okay, but what are you conscious of? What, rather, what are you conscious of? Conscious of hearing me, right? What are you conscious of, brother? Exactly. Sister, what you're conscious of sitting down, conscious of being here, the feeling, right? So our consciousness is based on our six sense bases. 
when you see your conscious, your consciousness arises, you see. When you hear your consciousness, your hearing consciousness arises, you hear. When you think of something, your mind consciousness arises. The consciousness arises only one at a time. That means you see, you hear, you think, you touch, you taste, you feel. It's actually only one at a time. But because we cannot see clearly, we think it's, we are hearing, seeing all at the same time. But it's actually not. It's actually happening so fast that when you see, you hear, it's all different, different consciousness arising and passing in at the same time. This is what we mean by consciousness. We have eye consciousness, ear consciousness. When something comes to your attention, your consciousness will arise. So, we are composed of matter, we are composed of consciousness, we are composed of feeling. Feeling can be three types. It can be positive, it can be negative, it can be, in certain cases, neutral. Uh, I think most of you here neutral right now. Like, neither, well, actually some of you will be quite comfortable. Like, if you see on the, on the floor, you don't sit on the chair, then you get the negative feelings, pain, like, aching, like, uncomfortable, can't wait for the lesson to end, all the negative feelings. Some of you may be enjoying this lesson. Ah, positive feeling, quite interesting. Hopefully. Like. So feelings are also part of our makeup. There's always, no matter how, there will always be pleasant feeling, unpleasant feeling, and occasionally neutral feeling for everything you see, you hear, you touch. Sure, one of these feelings will arise. Mental formations, sankara, these are our mental states. In other words, anger, hatred, compassion, frustration, irritation, enjoyment, things like that. Huh? So these are our mental states which, from which karma arises. Because as you like something, you enjoy it, you want more. So there is a greed arising. You don't like something, aversion arises. So this is the mental state. When you eat something, well, it's not too hot, not nice, so you push it away. That's a mental state, aversion. And then karma arises. When you scold somebody, you're angry, karma arises. When you do something good, you make a donation, you have generosity, karma arises also. So this is karma. The other one is perception. Perception means generally our memories. That means how we perceive things. Like for example, you never come to this temple before. After you come, oh, you have quite good memories. This temple is quite nice. The course is quite nice, quite good. Like the uh, first lesson, I like some of my friends come and take a look. Hey, this temple is very nice, good for teachings. So when they go back, there's this memory of this temple. So this is the perception of the temple. So in Buddhism, or what the Buddha discovered, is we are composed of only these things. Uh. We are composed of our body, our consciousness, our feelings, our mental formations, our perceptions. Nothing more than that. These are only the things which we are composed of. Then I go on to something called conventional and ultimate reality. Two types of reality in Buddhism. One called conventional, one called ultimate. How come reality got two types of reality? Reality is reality, right? There can only be one type of reality. But how come Buddhism breaks reality up into two types of reality? Conventional and ultimate reality. Okay, what's the difference? Conventional reality means we are distinct and identifiable entities and brother Lee. This is a table. Ultimate reality, we are no more than concept or fabrications. Conventional reality, I'm brother Lee. Ultimate reality, I'm only the five aggregates, nothing more than that. Conventional reality, this is a table. But ultimate reality is a piece of wood with four legs. If you take out one of the legs and the table drops, is it a table or not? It's a broken table, but you can't properly call it a table because the function of a table is to put things on there. But if a table is broken and you can't put things on, it's no longer a table. Do you see what I mean? So in ultimate reality, this is a piece of wood with four legs. I'm a person who is composed only of five aggregates. Okay, let me try to give you an example. Real life example. Brother, may I borrow you? Brother, James, come. Don't worry. Please, uh, Brother James, thanks for your support. Come, stay here. Don't worry, I won't do anything to hurt you. Okay, Brother James. Conventional reality, Brother James. Ultimate reality, Brother James is a body, different parts of the mind, all his stomach, skin, bones, liver, heart, so on and so forth. Everything, Brother James. Right? So Brother James, the conventional reality is Brother James. Ultimate reality is composed of many, many, many different parts. 
mind and matter. Correct? I can ask you one thing. The brother James that sit there and the brother James that stand here, is it the same brother James? Who say yes? Sister? Okay, who say no? You say no? Not the same brother James. You say not the same brother James. Sister? Not the same. Brother? You say the same? Brother? Same brother James. Not sure. Sister, any idea? Is it the same brother James that was sitting there and is, is it the same brother James sitting here? Now? Sister? Same. Okay. I prove to you it's an entirely different brother James. <laughs> the minute brother James sit there and the minute brother James stand here, millions of cells in his body has perished and new ones regenerated. So even though he looks the same, he's a different brother James. Ma. Millions of cells, literally his blood, his bones, his flesh, everything has changed. Right? He sit there and he stand there. How many minutes have passed? Two minutes, three minutes? Brother James has aged over the last two or three minutes. He has grown older the last two and three minutes. All right? So this process goes on when you're young up to now when you're old. It's only that we can't see it. We think it's the same brother James, but it's not the same brother James. It's a different brother James because something in him has changed. Secondly, his mind. Five great gates, right? His mind, his perceptions, his feelings, his thoughts. Just now, Brother James, sit there. Does he have a memory of standing here? No, right? Now he has a memory of standing here, right? So he has a new memory, right? So he's changed, right? His mind, his mental state has changed, right? And then before he think, oh, Brother Lee, he's a nice guy. Now he thinks, what oh, is Brother Lee? <laughs> don't know what the hell he's doing. So his perception of me has changed. His feeling has changed. So I prove to you, sitting there and standing here, he's not the same Brother James. His body has changed. His mind has changed. Thank you, Brother James. And the person sitting there again, isn't it a different Brother James? And the person going back home later, meet your wife, isn't it a different Brother James? And the person tomorrow, in five years, ten years, isn't it a different Brother James? So all of you, all of us, when we are young, teenager, different different thoughts, different perceptions, how we view things different. Our body also totally different. Now I'm almost 50. Don't know why, right? Okay, I'm just joking. <laughs> anyway, so now I'm almost 50. So when I'm a teen, different. 20 years old, 30 years old, 40, different. Now different. When I grow old, 70, 60, hopefully I live to that now. Different again. So, we are no more than concepts or fabrications. Right? That means we think that Brother James is Brother James. But actually, it's only a concept. Brother James is no more than a concept. It's no more than a fabrication. But we need this conventional reality for our daily life. We can't say Brother James 10 years ago or the Brother James 5 minutes ago. Those who say the same Brother James is correct in conventional reality. In conventional reality, it's the same Brother James. But in ultimate reality, it is not the same Brother James. He has changed. So therefore, in ultimate reality, Brother James is only a concept. Do you, do you see what I mean? So this is the meaning of anatta. There's actually no permanent self. I've just shown you, there's no such thing as a permanent self. If you want to see even your soul, if I say people who claim you have a soul, is the soul part of you or not? Even if the soul, if the soul is part of you, it has to change one. If the soul is part of you, it also has feelings, it also has feelings, it also has memories. So therefore, the soul, the soul also changes. Correct? And if the soul doesn't change, then it's not a part of you. It's no more, no much more than a block of wood. So therefore, anatta means there's no permanent soul, there's no permanent entity. That's why I like to use the word insubstantiality. Brother James, you and I, everything is in ultimate reality. We are insubstantial. Substantial means something permanent which doesn't change. Insubstantial means something which does not have real substance and if something always changes well it doesn't have real substance right so as i mentioned in conventional reality we exist as an individual with, with a name but ultimately we are composed of different physical parts which make up our body and the various aspects of our feelings our memories as i demonstrated to you just now 
So, our body and mind are in a constant state of change. Millions of cells die and are replaced every second. Just pick up any science book, you can verify this for yourself. We have different feelings all the time. We, are, we acquire new memories and lose old ones all the time. So, like I mentioned, the person that came into this class, all of you, and the person sitting here is different, and the person leaving the class is different again. So this is something which is difficult to get used to. You can uh, get used to it, but it will take time, especially for, even for myself. When I first came into Buddhism, very hard to get used to this kind of concept. No God, la, no soul, la, no this, no that. But if you meditate, you practice slowly, slowly, you begin to see clearly. So Buddhism don't expect to see everything straight away. It will take time. It's a progress, it's a journey. So give yourself time, you practice, you acquire more knowledge, you study, and then you see these things more clearly. Anatta, we do not have any permanent substance. We are, unch- we are changing all the time, in substantiality. So we are, but the thing is that we are conditioned to see that we are real and that we are permanent. But as I shown, shown to you, this is just no more than a concept. So we still need conventional reality to function. Uh. So we still see ourselves enduring and distinct entities, but in reality, we are not. So unless we practice the Eightfold Path, unless we meditate, we cannot see these things clearly. Why? Why you cannot see these things clearly? Human psychology. First one, self-protection. We always want something to protect us, like some God help save us. This is human nature. La. Even like many people, they pray to the Buddha, save us, la. please, Kwan Yung, save us. Normally in trouble, we want someone to protect us. This is self-protection. The other one relevant here is self-preservation. We always want to live forever. Who don't want to live forever? Of course, every single one of us wants to live forever. But this is a psychological need, a psychological instinct, human nature, self-preservation. That's why it's hard to see things like anatta. Because anatta is totally a different thing of this. Anatta means we don't really have a permanent self, which is uh, in contradiction to our human instinct of self-preservation. So normally people cannot see anatta because ignorance and delusion, uh, they don't really study, they don't go into Buddhism, they think, oh, we are permanent. I mean, like, for example, we talk to a lot of people, talk about death. Who likes to talk about death in general? But the fact is that one day we will die. So if you don't look at it directly, you don't study, then you will always, always be subject to ignorance and delusion, and you can never see these things clearly. Dukkha, unsatisfactoriness, suffering. I will elaborate more on this the next time. Why? Hard to see this because you're always having craving, you're always having aversion. We want this, we want that, we don't like this, we don't like that. But we don't go deeper into it. So therefore, we cannot really see Dukkha clearly. And again, this is a difficult one. Anatta, insubstantiality, non-self. Why we cannot see? Because attachment to the self, attachment to the ego. This is one of the most powerful human instincts, ego. But Buddhism goes the other way. Once you start to let go of your ego, once you start to let go of yourself, you see things clearly, that is where the real happiness comes in. You can never have real happiness if you have too much ego, too much self. Because you will be clinging to this, clinging to that. And the things you cling to, if it's external, by the very nature of something external to you, it will always change. No matter what you cling to, you desire this car, work so hard for it, Guarantee you within three to five years you will be so sick of it. Why? Because your perceptions have changed, the car has grown older. So if you can not see this clearly, you always have attachments to self, to ego. You can never have true peace and happiness. But once you practice, you see this, then really true peace and happiness can arise. So we've seen anicca, dukkha, anatta, impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, insubstantiality. So like I said, beginning to understand these three characteristics is to see the true nature of existence. What we want in Buddhism, or what Buddhism teaches you, is to see the true nature of existence. Not like some other teachings, they will tell you this, they will tell you that, all the fanciful things. Buddhism, cut through all this, see clearly what is the nature of existence, and once you see clearly, then you really will have peace and happiness. And how you do this is to practice the Noble Eightfold Path, which is uh, the second part of our lesson. Okay, so any questions? Okay, attachment to family members. 
fair enough. It's very natural to be attached to family members because, like your children, for example, you give birth to them, you see them grow up. Sure, attached, right? This is human nature. Very natural. But the fact is that your children are their own people. Right? This is something very hard to let go, especially mothers. Mothers very hard to let go of their children, very attached. But they fail to realize that the children are independent entities. Uh. When they grow old, grow up, 20, 30, they have their mind or they won't. I mean, you sure, I mean, I'm sure you come across some mothers, some parents, always try to control the child. Do this, do that. You must study this course, you must go and work that course, you must have how many children, you must do this, that, that, that. The reason they do this is because they fail to understand that the, their child is, wants to be their own life. They are too attached. So this is one thing, if you are too attached, it's no good. You will suffer. Not only you will suffer, your child will suffer correctly. So how you would deal with this is that you have to realize that your child grows up. Eventually they have to lead their own lives. Eventually they have to have their own families, their own children. You have to slowly let go. Eventually you will die, eventually they will die. Right? So you practice compassionate attachment. In other words, you attach, but you see it clearly. You see this clearly. That you have to eventually let go, let them lead their own lives. There's anything you can do. Lah. Rather than try to cling to them, they, because some people they think, wow, their children, 50 years old, they still think it's teenager. So they cannot let go. So this is extreme, too much attachment. So it's good to see these things more clearly. That's why I say, if you see these things more clearly, more peace and happiness for yourself, more peace and happiness for your children too.